Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our program today, A Taste of Home, Part One, Building the Flavors of Japanese America. And I want to start off by saying a huge thanks to the Consulate General of Japan in Los Angeles for their support of today's program. I also wanted to say another thank you. We will be having a a uh, short cooking demo by cookbook author and designer Azusa Oda at the end of the program and that um, some of the products today were donated generously by Wazama Asian Foods Incorporated and JFC Incorporated as well as um, the uh, Takara Sake um, company so thank you so much to all of them and finally there'll be a couple there's some books from the authors from today's program as well and you can find those in the Janum store and finally, um, while Janum cannot be open to the public at the moment, um, we are putting on many programs and different opportunities like this one through our Janum from Home initiative. And um, as part of Janum from Home, like you'll see today, we'll be having even more collections offerings, things from our education department, um, doing virtual school tours now, our store is still open and many things like that. Um, so I hope that you'll continue to tune in and check out on our website um, all of the opportunities and also consider becoming a member. Um, Jana members get discounts in the store as well as free admission to different programs and the museum when it's open. And you also know that you are supporting the museum and allowing us to continue to put on programming like this, continue to exist um, and be a part of this amazing community. So thank you so much to all our members here today. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm really, really excited for this. Um, and I want to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Dr. Valerie Matsumoto. Valerie J. Matsumoto she is a professor in the Department of History and Department of Asian American Studies at UCLA. And in addition to her book, City Girls, uh, The Nisei Social World in Los Angeles, 1920 to 1950. She is the author of Farming the Home Place, a Japanese American Community in California, 1919 to 1982. And she co-edited the essay collection, Over the Edge, Remapping the American West. Um, she has received the Toshio and Doris Hoshide Distinguished Teaching Award, the UCLA Distinguished Teaching Award, and the Award for Excellence in Graduate Mentoring and Teaching from the UCLA Asian American Graduate Study Student Association. And in 2017, she was appointed to the George and Sake Aratani Endowed Chair on the Japanese American Incarceration Redress and Community. Um, and we are so lucky and so honored to have her here today to talk to us about food and history. Um, and so I wanna invite you, Valerie, uh, to join on screen now and turn your camera on. Um, and thank you so much for being here today. Oops. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking for a slide. Oops. All right, are we good now? Yep, it looks great, thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much to Joy Yamaguchi for inviting me. I'm delighted to be part of a program with Joy, Ashi, and Azusa Oda. Um, I greatly enjoyed Azusa's last Janum class and her baked version of Japanese fried chicken looks so tasty, I immediately bought her cookbook. So I was asked to discuss the history of Japanese American food. And today I can only scratch the surface of this fascinating subject. I will talk about pre-war food with a brief mention of conditions in the World War II camps, and then we'll discuss the role of food in post-war community rebuilding. The pre-war ethnic press, World War II camp art, autobiographies, girls club records, and community cookbooks show the adaptability and creativity that have shaped Japanese American food ways, that is, ideas and practices related to food. And I'd be happy to take comments and questions at the end. 
The food prepared by Ise and Nise women in the pre-World War II period reflects their efforts to sustain family, community, and ethnic cultural practices, as well as to cross social and cultural boundaries. In the context of race relations in the 1920s and 30s, the preparation and consumption of Western dishes can be read not only as a sign of interest in new flavors, but also as a way of claiming and demonstrating being American. Their tastes also show the influence of regional demographics and interactions with other minority groups, especially here in Southern California. At the same time, Nisei women continue to maintain symbolic holiday fare and imaginatively experiment with familiar Japanese dishes. Culinary experimentation also interested Issei women, such as the mother of Mary Nishi Ishizuka, who excelled at both Japanese and Western cooking. She made mouth-watering skimono and sukiyaki, as well as corn chowder. Ishizuka remembered fondly the bottles and bottles of root beer that she made for us, end quote. Many Japanese women shared culinary knowledge with their friends. Urban Issei women also encountered new dishes through jobs as domestic workers in white households and from neighbors. For example, Setsugo Matsunaga Nishi recalled that her mother learned from an African-American neighbor how to bake deep dish apple pie. Issei Takahonda attended adult classes in English and cooking at the Norris Dairy School in West LA where she learned how to prepare a Thanksgiving dinner. Her daughter Rose recalled she learned how to make pumpkin pie as well as banana nut bread and cookies. We had peanut butter cookies coming out of our ears, end quote. Many Nisei girls also encountered and learned to prepare Western dishes in school. For example, my mother, Sachi Fuji Matsumoto, who grew up in Northern California, remembers how her older sister Ritsu introduced the whole family to cheese when she learned to make cheese biscuits in a junior high school cooking class. My mom says she thought it was the best thing she had ever tasted. Ritsu was a talented baker, also producing delicious cakes. Most Issei women did not know how to bake as homes in Japan did not usually have ovens in the early 20th century. So it was, it was often the Nisei who first learned to make Western confections. Indeed, it was children who introduced their parents to American customs, such as celebrating birthdays. In Japan at that time, everyone turned a year older at New Year's, and individual birthdays were not celebrated. But Nisei children wanted the kinds of festivities their friends and classmates had and Issei parents wanted to please them. Here we see that a, a beautiful cake is the centerpiece of a Nisei girl's birthday party in Boyle Heights in East LA around 1936. We can also see the kids are enjoying bottles of soda. The preparation and consumption of food became a bonding experience for Nisei girls, particularly as part of their club activities which thrived in West Coast cities like Los Angeles. Together, they experimented with making foods unfamiliar to their parents, like seafoam candy and fudge. They often utilized their culinary skills on behalf of their organizations, holding box lunch socials and cookie sales to raise money for club activities and community service projects. From the 1920s, Japanese Americans displayed interest not only in Japanese cuisine, but also Western dishes. Other ethnic cuisines also held appeal. By the mid 1930s, the Nisei women appear to have been most interested in three areas of cuisine, Japanese, American, and Chinese. The Nisei women found some culinary instruction in the recipes offered by the Rafu Shimpo newspaper. In a time when few ethnic cookbooks appeared in English, the Japanese American newspapers in Los Angeles and San Francisco 
constituted an important resource for second generation women who wished to prepare Japanese dishes. And clearly, many of them did. In 1936, the Rafu Shimpo reported in a special supplement, quote, in many of the American homes of Japanese descent, we find that a large part of the food habits handed down by the elders are being perpetuated. Adding optimistically, Japanese meals will continue to be served long after the first generation will have passed on, end quote. One of the gems in uh, Janum's archival collection reflects Nisei young women's desire to maintain Japanese home cooking, as well as the ways in which their dishes reveal evolving tastes and a widening range of ingredients. In 1930s Los Angeles, Natsue Fujimoto, a Nisei teenager, compiled a booklet she titled Recipes Japanese. Carefully documenting the food her family enjoyed and considered Japanese, she included dishes ranging from nasuni, sautéed eggplant, and traditional New Year's ozoni soup to baked flatfish and shrimp salad. On many of the recipes, she noted, serves five, the number in the Fujimoto family. This suggests that these dishes constituted part of her family's regular diet. Fujimoto's shrimp salad with pineapple and cucumber shows how Japanese immigrant families adapted the idea of the Western salad, dressing theirs with Japanese sweet wine or mirin, vinegar, ginger, and mustard. Women's culinary experimentation and improvisation stimulated the development of hybrid forms that became part of Japanese American cuisine. For instance, the Rafu Shimpo offered a recipe for pakai or sweet and sour pork that reflects this hybridization. Among the ingredients were katakuriko, a Japanese starch made of dog tooth violets, shoyu or soy sauce, green chili pepper, an element of regional Mexican American cuisine, and a can of pineapple, hinting at the labor migration routes that Chinese and Japanese workers pursued from Hawaii to the continental United States. Japanese immigrants and their children drew on a rich array of culinary traditions in the multi-ethnic landscape of the US West. From the mid 1920s to the Second World War, ethnic holiday food held deep importance for Japanese Americans, urban and rural. Issei and Nisei women played a crucial role in preparing the symbolic dishes central to the celebration of family, community, and shared ethnicity. The mothers and daughters in this photo have gathered to celebrate Girls' Day, as we can tell by the doll display in the background. I think you can see the emperor and empress dolls or members of their court. And we can guess that the party goers are eating Japanese food as suggested by the chopsticks or hashi on the plates. New Year's Day or Shogatsu was the major holiday for Japanese Americans whose ways of celebrating varied somewhat depending on the region of Japan from which they had come. A central New Year's food, rice cakes or mochi entailed elaborate often communal preparation called mochitsuki. Rose Honda recalled that relatives and friends would gather a few days before New Year's for this festive occasion. And women spent hours preparing special dishes beforehand, since supposedly no work should be done on that day. They labored to prepare a range of emblematic dishes invoking health and good fortune for the year to come. Most Japanese families began New Year's Day with ozoni, a clear soup in which the mochi floated, symbolizing prosperity. Such cultural practices faced severe testing in the crucible of World War II. Japanese American family and community life on the West Coast was shattered by forced uprooting and incarceration during the war the Issei and Nisei struggled to adjust to the crude communal facilities in the hastily constructed camps. 
Nisei artist Mini Okubo's drawings of the barracks, latrines, and mess halls, and her description of the camp for, fair convey the disruption of pre-war family routines and diet. Confined in the Topaz camp in Utah, Okubo observed, often a meal consisted of rice, bread, and macaroni, or beans, bread, and spaghetti. At one time, we were served liver for several weeks until we went on strike." End quote. Increasingly, many people, especially the youth, began to spend meal times with their peers rather than family members. Mess hall eating was only part of the hard, wartime hardships faced by Japanese Americans, but it reflects their loss of autonomy and the impact of mass exclusion and incarceration on the family structure. As these paintings by Kango Takamura show, the Issei and Nisei made efforts, despite their harsh circumstances, to maintain cherished customs and to bolster morale. Here we see Mochitsuki at Manzanar on December 31st, 1942. The men are outside pounding the cooked glutinous rice and inside a mess hall, women are shaping the hot sticky mass into balls. We can see that they are socializing while they work, affirming community ties while they prepare the mochi deemed indispensable for good luck in the new year and signaling their hopes for the future. Post-war resettlement would present continuing challenges. As before the war, food became part of the rebuilding of community ties and organizations. After the war ended in 1945, Japanese Americans were permitted to return to the West Coast where they faced lingering racial hostility, residential segregation, and a swelling labor force. Jobs and housing were hard to come by. The Issei and Nisei scrambled to find wage paid work. Many men went into gardening while women entered the garment industry and if lucky, clerical work. As the Rafu Shimpo showed, the focus of the early post-war years was survival. In this period, growing numbers of the Nisei, whose median age was 17 at the outset of the war, began to marry and form families. Post-war Nisei households largely reflected the sexual division of labor that prevailed in mainstream society and the immigrant community. Whether as daughters or wives, Japanese American women were responsible for the bulk of domestic work. And one of their key responsibilities was food preparation. As Japanese American families returned and communities took root, girls club activities resurged in Southern California by the late 1940s. The Adamettes, who began as a group of sixth graders attending the West LA United Methodist Church, provide a dynamic example. As for the pre-war Nisei Girls Clubs, service was an important component of the Adamettes activities, and they had great impact in shaping church traditions after the war. Rose Honda, one of their two advisors, explained, quote, they were the ones who started the bazaar. They called it May Bazaar. And they went out to the strawberry fields and picked the strawberries and made strawberry jam and sold it. They were the ones who started the Easter breakfast. They did all the cooking and they must have served 50 or 75 or more people, seven girls, end quote. Like Nisei Girls Clubs before the war, the Adamettes utilized culinary skills to raise morale and strengthen community ties. They exemplify creativity, adaptability, and resilience. Another example can be found in the abundant Japanese American community compilation cookbooks that flourished from 1960s onward. Japanese Americans did not invent the compilation cookbook but I don't know if any other ethnic minority group has produced so many. Such recipe compilations became popular fundraising items. For several decades, it seemed as though every Japanese American church and club had its own cookbook. 
Janum has a great collection. I'll bet some of you also have one or more of these cookbooks. The first such Japanese American publication might have been East West Flavors, an elegant practical cookbook created by the Women's Auxiliary of the West Los Angeles Japanese American Citizens League in 1965-66 to raise funds for a community organization. The recipes reflected the influences of Chinese, French, Italian, Japanese, Mexican, and mainstream American cuisines. I must say that their recipe for sun gold cake with maraschino cherries and custard uh, frosting became a birthday favorite when I was growing up. The majority of the contributors were women, but notably a few men also shared recipes. And the names of some contributors suggest interracial and interethnic friendships. So what can we glean from these cookbooks as a wonderful historical source? as well as a source for great meals. Their pages reflect both continuity and change. Persisting features include a love for the flavors of Nihon Shoku, Japanese food, and the importance of holiday specialties. For example, many community cookbooks include a section on the meanings and process of preparing New Year's dishes. The Centenary United Methodist Church cookbook even includes how-to diagrams, which suggests that many Japanese Americans need instructions. New Year's sections also often discuss cultural practices that younger Japanese Americans may be unfamiliar with. So you might notice on the page that says how to roll makizushi, uh, near the bottom there's a note that says uh, that uh, tells that tells the reader that the Japanese use five to seven ingredients and never even numbers. However, it doesn't explain that this is partly to avoid the number four, which in Japanese is a homonym for death and thus unlucky. As shown by the Orange County Buddhist Temples from Generation to Generation cookbook, volume two, new technology such as the microwave has made some preparation faster and less onerous. So recipes for chocolate mochiko cake or azuki shortbread, not pictured here, display imaginative adaptation and experimentation. I'd like to highlight one of the recipe collections created by Janum volunteers. I think they may have produced three, although sadly they may be out of print now. Vaguely Asian salad and next best thing to Robert Redford cake not only show Japanese American culinary creativity and adoption of some mainstream trends, but also humor and playfulness. The latter recipe, whose 1970s origin can be roughly dated by the choice of heartthrob, also suggests that increasingly busy schedules became a factor in late 20th century lives of Angelinos who might turn to the convenience of instant pudding mix and frozen whip topping to save time. With the rise of the food network, the internet and food blogs, the heyday of the Japanese American community cookbook might be over, but they remain a wonderful window into friendship circles, community spirit and history. In conclusion, from the 1920s to the present, Japanese American girls and women have quite literally nourished their communities, preparing the food for a wide variety of private and public events, ranging from everyday meals to church fundraisers. They maintain the Japanese cultural practices through the cooking of staple foods like rice and okazu and special holiday dishes laden with symbolism. At the same time, they also introduced other cuisines into the ethnic community, adjusting flavors to suit Japanese American tastes. The girls club activities, the food sections of the ethnic newspapers, the community cookbooks and family recipes like those of Natsue Fujimoto reveal the eclectic influences and the delight in experimentation that have expanded Japanese American foodways. This photo of a Japanese American oshogatsu spread, including tuna sashimi, teriyaki chicken, and renkon, 
as well as spam musubi and finger jello reflects this artistry, labor, and love. Thank you. I hope you're all there plotting along with me. Thank you so much for sharing that. I also wanted to share with you that I actually just pulled this from my shelf earlier <laughs> um, to look up a, see if they had a butter mochi recipe, but um, <laughs> I love seeing that in your presentation. And I, I um, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And um, I'm gonna put the link to your book as well in the uh, chat. So if folks want to learn more. Um, but we will also be inviting you back at the end of this program. So if you all have had any questions from that, you can either leave them in the chat or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, but thank you so much again. I really appreciated learning so much and seeing so much of our history. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so before we bring <laughs> um, Professor Matsumoto back, um, I am going to welcome Dr. Kristen Hayashi, who is our Janum Director of Collections Management and Access. And um, something that we've been really excited to be able to do during this uh, Janum from home time, <laughs> we can't welcome people into our doors, is allow people access to our collections, which oftentimes is shut behind doors. Um, and so being able to open that up and welcome all of you into our collections has been really, really exciting. So with that, I want to welcome Kristen to come and share some more about our collections. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Joy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am going to sort of give you a taste um, from Janum's collection and so show some artifacts, uh, a sampling, if you will, um, from Janum's permanent collection uh, to sort of talk about this um, topic of a taste of home. Let's see. Um, let's see, my toolbar has disappeared. Okay, here we go. Okay. So for this program, we were sort of exploring the question of what were Japanese immigrants cooking and eating in the United States in the early 20th century. Um, so this portion, all these artifacts that I'm going to show you um, are from the pre-war uh, era. So early immigration to about World War II. Um, and so to answer this question, uh, we pulled some artifacts and um, historical photographs and also for today's program. Uh, but you can see that it's assumably Japanese immigrants um, and their families are having a picnic um, on a beach somewhere. And what we can tell from, from this photograph is they are using chopsticks and they're eating watermelon or suika. And I do know that um, in Japanese culture, there is a game called suika wadi which um, is in some ways sort of like hitting a piñata. But from my understanding, um, someone is blindfolded and everyone else sort of gives instructions on how to approach the watermelon. And the goal is to crack it open um, and enjoy the, the sweet fruit. Um, and so perhaps that's what um, they're doing at this gathering, but you see the watermelon in this photograph. And this photograph as well, this is from Maui in the early, 1900s, again, another picnic where you see men and women um, enjoying themselves. We see perhaps soda bottles um, and I see chopsticks and um, bento boxes as well as watermelon. But unfortunately we can't really see inside that bento box that you see at the center of the picnic blanket. What are they eating? I wonder, um, same thing with this group of men who are picnicking in Oregon uh, near a lake. Um, and again, we see bento boxes sort of in the center um, and they're enjoying both food and drink. And I just, I love how, you know, everyone is so dressed up uh, to have a picnic, um, but again, don't know what they're eating exactly. Um, same thing with this photograph. We see the man in the foreground, assumably using chopsticks and then maybe eating out of some type of, of bento box. Um, this photograph is also from Oregon. Uh, you see the lake in the background, and this is circa uh, 1915. Um, so we assume they're eating Japanese food, um, but 
I think you'll find that through the rest of the artifacts and photographs that I highlight that while Japanese immigrants maintain Japanese food traditions at home, there's evidence that they were taking part in shaping a very distinct Japanese American food culture. Um, and they also played a role in shaping the American food palette as well uh, through the industries they worked in. So I'll show you some artifacts to sort of get at that. Um, so another question, what are, what are Japanese, what, which Japanese food traditions continued once you know, immigrants came to the United States, especially at home and at social gatherings. So finally, we see this photograph. Um, this is a gathering at Koichi and Kaoru Kamikawa's house in Fresno, California um, in May of 1916. And um, finally, we see, we can identify makizushi in the middle of the table there and perhaps some other Japanese dishes as well as sake on the table. So signifying that for this special occasion, um, Japanese food seems to be um, what's being served and enjoyed. Um, so these are some artifacts that sort of, sort of show you um, what you know, Japanese families were using to, to cook at home. Um, so starting with, oh, this is a very fancy jubako. So I'm sure this was used on special occasions like Osho, Shogatsu maybe um, to, to sort of display good luck foods like mame and, order, and other lucky foods. Um, so it wouldn't have been used too often. Um, here is a, a teapot. We don't know too much about this teapot, um, but it sort of reflects um, that, you know, I'm sure tea, green tea was very ubiquitous within Japanese immigrant households. And would have been served on many occasions. Uh, this is a, an oroshigane or a food grater, slightly different than um, a Western food grater. This gets a finer, um, uh, grates things finer. So I'm sure it was for like daikon oroshi. Um, and then of course the sushi press. So this mold would have molded rice into rectangular um, shapes. And then this is a bento bako. Um, so this would have been more utilitarian and maybe would have carried lunch. Um, someone would have carried their lunch in this to take to work. And so at the bottom compartment, they would have put rice or some other basic staple. And then in the top compartment, um, they would have had fish and meat and pickles or whatever else they had on hand for lunch. Um, in terms of Japanese food traditions that continued um, here in the United States, um, you know, Valerie also talked about mochizuki and um, in our collection, we have several kine and usu. So the kine is the mallet that you see there on the left. Um, we have several usus in the collection. And then on the right here, you see the bamboo steamer um, that would have been used to steam the sweet rice um, that would then be pounded into mochi. Here's just a close-up of that really fancy uh, jubako. So we talked about sort of um, home and the types of foods maybe were being prepared at home, but what are Japanese immigrants cooking, serving, and producing for others? Um, and we know that many Japanese immigrants worked in domestic service and agriculture, and they um, opened restaurants. And I think it's through these different um, industries, they're really shaping um, food culture, American food culture. So this is an item that we have in our collection that's very curious and I would love to do further research on. This is a book called How to Make Entrees and Make, How to Cook Entrees and Make Salad. So this is from 1909. And from the description that we have, um, this was like almost like a textbook or a handbook um, for Issei um, men who came over as houseboys meaning that they worked like in a white, you know, upper class family's home. They did domestic chores such as cooking, cleaning, um, and, uh, um, and in exchange for room and board. And so the idea of this book was supposed, was to sort of, um, I think help them to understand the types of foods that they were supposed to prepare for the family that they were living and working for. Um, so you see these very curious photographs of um, these fancy dishes, which as a 21st, 21st century American, I don't even recognize 
Um, but in addition to these photographs that, that showed the final dish, there were also you know, recipes and instructions on how to make these dishes. Um, so on the left here, I found it really interesting and kind of funny that um, sauces were a big part of this book, including different types of mayonnaise. So you see red mayonnaise, green mayonnaise, and white mayonnaise. Um, and on the right here, this is a page that I also found very interesting. Um, it was all these recipes on how to use brain, which I assume would have been some kind of calf or, or cattle or cow brain. Um, but I think more research needs to be done, but it does seem like brain was maybe a type of food that um, was part of the American diet um, in the turn of the 20th century. So, you know, I just, I look at these recipes and just wonder like how much miscommunication there would have been or how curious, you know, these Issei um, men would have found these recipes that they had to prepare for the, the families that they're working for. Um, I don't know if in this photograph, these are, you know, houseboys, but it just sort of made me think that um, it's interesting that if they were, you know, um, that they were cooking American food in their day jobs, but then when they had some leisure time, I'm sure they were eating um, Japanese food. So you see, you do see some bento boxes in the center there. Um, but I love this photo of these, you know, men at leisure. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, the role of Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans in agriculture, um, producing, you know, food for the American table. And uh, so in our collection, we have quite a few like panoramic photographs and photographs that show um, Japanese Americans um, on farms um, and harvesting produce. And then we have this really incredible um, uh, produce crate label um, collection. And I think, you know, in addition to showing the geographic diversity of these farms, it also shows the diversity of what they were growing. Um, so I'll just kind of scroll through some of these really great graphics. And then this is a produce crate um, from T. Kishi. And um, this is Tajiro Kishi, who was one of the uh, founding farmers of Yamato Colony, which was in Livingston. Um, and we also have his crate label there too, um, the Kishi's grew grapes, or at least what, this is what that sugar pack was for, the grapes that they grew. And the Kishi still live in, in Livingston. Um, Japanese immigrants also opened up restaurants that served a variety of different types of cuisines. Um, I think, you know, those who did work in domestic um, service, you know, and learned how to make these American foods did open restaurants um, in some cases that served or catered to an American taste and served American food. So you had like restaurants in Riverside, like the George Washington restaurant that served like an American breakfast or uh, American restaurant in Fresno that served uh, American food. Um, you also had, in this case, a uh, chop suey restaurant. This is Cherry Blossom Restaurant, which was located in um, downtown Los Angeles in Grand Central Market. And if you go to Grand Central Market today, um, it still somewhat looks similar to this, the food stalls uh, that make up the, the market there. And so Cherry Blossom um, was uh, again served chop suey. And so you can see in the background of this photograph, there's a menu at the top um, that shows some of the things they served, including different types of chop suey. Um, and we have other photographs in the collection that show that they expanded their menu a bit more um, and included egg foo young and also a, an American breakfast. Um, but you see that in the 1930s, you could get chicken chop suey for 30 cents. So this is Kichitaro Muto's Cherry Blossom Restaurant. And we also have one of his ledgers that shows, you know, what he purchased in terms of um, groceries for a, a single day, I guess. And so you see the diversity of ingredients. You see oranges, milk, bread, tofu age, fish, nap napa, spinach, and onions. Um, to show the diversity of, of food that, that were on the menu. Again, chop suey. 
and also um, an American breakfast. Um, Japanese immigrants al also opened um, more authentic Japanese restaurants. This is Monseon uh, Noodles and Tendon restaurant that was located in uh, Los Angeles' Little Tokyo. And so you can see from the menu that it's definitely more of an authentic Japanese menu um, showing different types of noodle dishes and um, donburi. So can you imagine, again, this is early 1900s, but being able to get a tendon bowl for 30 cents. And this is um, a, an item in the collection that, that Valerie mentioned um, a couple times. So this is Natsue Fujimoto's recipe book. And I just thought this was really interesting because it's really showing, um, again, this hybrid food culture, this very distinct Japanese American um, food culture that starts to form. So um, Natsue Fujimoto's parents operated a restaurant before and after the war. And so, you know, she talks about some of the recipes um, so in addition to these really great illustrations that show you, for example, how to skewer fish so that you can put it under the broiler and it won't fall apart, um, or the daikon, like how you can insert skewers um, to prevent the daikon from falling apart as you dice it. Um, there are also recipes that show both very traditional Japanese um, recipes like the yaki sakana, but also at the bottom on the right page, um, you see kotai no yasai tsume butter mushi or stuffed sea bream. And you notice that the ingredients, you know, aren't necessarily Japanese, including Worcestershire sauce. Um, so again, shows this like adaptation or, or hybrid food culture that's starting to form. And so in addition to restaurants, Japanese immigrants also open confectionaries. Um, so these are kata, senbei kata um, from Benkyodo company, which was opened by um, Suyeichi Okamura uh, in San Francisco in 1906. He was the founder of Benkyoto. And here's one of the um, display tins that was, um, that held senbei um, on shelves in the store. And Benkyoto still is in operation today. And here in the center of this photograph is Yasuo Hamano, and he founded um, Umeya, um, rice cake company in Los Angeles' Little Tokyo in the 1920s. Um, and before the war, the operations were pretty small. Um, a lot of the senbei and arare was um, delivered by employees. But after the war, um, the senbei and, and rice crackers really took off. And so Umeya was producing rice crackers at a much larger um, scale. So that's what this um, rice cracker cutter demonstrate is just this mass production of um, rice crackers. And so this um, cutter would fit on a piece of machinery, which we also have in the museum. And it would roll over rice cracker dough and punch out the ume or plum flower shapes um, in mass. And uh, I think, you know, umea, we're all nostalgic when we think about umea and Benkyodo and, you know, all the wonderful confectionaries. Um, and, uh, Here's just again some of the photos of these artifacts from Benkyodo and Umeya. And so sort of like in conclusion, I think, you know, all these artifacts that you see here, the, the sushi molds, the, the kine or the mochi mallet, um, the rice cracker, the plum shaped rice crackers, and also the bento um, box that you see in the bottom right, I think are all so familiar to us um, today. And so it really shows that the, the food culture that Japanese immigrants brought over with them has really shaped, you know, Japanese American um, food ways, to, you know, continuing today. Um, and, and it also that they shaped um, the American food palette too. And, and I think introduced um, Japanese foods to the American palate. So um, it was so much fun to pull these artifacts uh, from our collection. We have so many really great artifacts to talk about food history. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Troy. Thank you so much for sharing all of those. That was um, just so interesting to see what a vast collection we have. And um, it really, I think, tied really into what um, Professor Matsumoto was talking about earlier. So 
really grateful for that. Um, so thank you so much for that. And we'll have you back in a little bit um, to talk a little bit more and answer a few questions that we got throughout this presentation. So thank you so much. Um, so with that, um, I don't know about you, but I am uh, getting hungry. <laughs> um, so for the next part of this presentation today, we wanted to kind of tie in what we had talked about before to the present day, as we talked about, there's a lot of food history that's just continued. Um, and one of the things that you saw in the collections was a rice ball maker, that green um, mold that could be used to make it. So we thought, um, why don't we invite a cookbook author and designer, Azusa Oda, to create a tutorial about um, musubi or onigiri rice balls. Um, if you haven't gotten her cookbook yet, as um, Professor Matsumoto mentioned, it is incredible. It's a really great um, resource. So I'll put the link to where you can get that. But um, she so kindly put together this tutorial that um, we'll be watching now. And special thanks um, one more time to uh, the companies Wazama Asian Foods Incorporated, Takara Sake USA Incorporated, and JFC International Incorporated for their um, donations of products. So with that, I'm going to um, share uh, our next um, presentation. So thank you so much. Hi, and welcome. I'm Azusa Oda, author of Japanese Cookbook for Beginners and the food blog Humble Bean. Today we're going to be making musubi, also known as onigiri. And um, I love onigiri musubi because it's a handheld food which you can take to go and kids love it. And also there's endless possibilities. So let's get started. Today we're gonna to be making two musubis. Um, one is a kind of like a traditional classic umeboshi musubi with my little twist, and also a takikomi gohan um, musubi. And for today's demo, I'm gonna be using this rice. It's called yuki no kakera, and it's a variety that's relatively, recent, uh, relatively new, and um, it combines Koshi hikari, that variety, and mochi gome, which is the sweet rice used to make mochi, um, to get kind of like a hybrid. So the rice is a little stickier than your typical rice, and it um, tastes good even when it's like cooled down. So it's really good for you know using this rice if you want to pack some musubi for the picnic or you know in a bento. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and. Um, put this rice in the pot. You'll notice I'm using an instant pot. I'm going to show you how to make it in here. Um, it makes really good rice. So I'm going to take two cups of this rice. And I'm actually going to subtract two tablespoons of this rice. and instead add um, red rice. This red rice is um, gonna give the rice a little bit of a pink color, which I thought would really be a nice complement to the umeboshi that I'm gonna put inside the musubi. So that's gonna go in here as well. Um, I'm gonna show you how to wash this rice um, with using more of a traditional method um, and for that, I'm going to add some water in here and kind of get the grains wet. Okay, so um, basically the movement is like a scooping movement and then pressing down. And what you're doing by uh, doing this movement is rustling the grains against each other to kind of rub the starch off. And so I'm going to do this very gently. And while I'm doing this motion, I'm also going to be rotating the pot clockwise. So this is what it looks like. Okay, now I'm going to rinse this off. Um, so 
I'm gonna go to the sink and do that. Okay, you can see in this first wash, it's very milky. So I'm gonna tip this water out. Again, be very careful not to let any of the grains go down the drain. And then I'm gonna repeat that process. And so I do this usually about three rounds of kind of scrubbing the rice and then rinsing it off. So um, your, the water is not gonna to become totally clear and that's okay. Um, you don't wanna wash it too much. Okay. So now I have the washed rice and I'm gonna leave it to strain like this um, for a little bit. And that'll help you get the, a precise water measurement um, when we go to cook it. So after about 10 minutes, I'm just going to, um, I emptied the pot of water because some water had accumulated down here. I'm gonna add this rice. And then I'm going to add the same amount um, of water into the pot. Okay, and here's a little cooking tip. We're gonna add, there's this takara miri. And if you add two teaspoons to the rice, we have two cups of rice, two teaspoons of this, it'll make your rice a little fluffier. So um, if you don't know what mirin is, it's a fermented um, alcoholic cooking. It's used for cooking, but it's naturally sweet because of the fermentation process. Um, so we've added a little bit of that meeting in here. And that's it. I'm going to stir this up a little bit and then it's going to go in the instant pot. And it'll cook for three minutes and then natural release, which takes about, I think, an additional 10 to 15 minutes. So all in all, it's not necessarily faster than cooking it in a rice cooker or uh, the stove, but I think the quality of the rice is really nice, actually. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So for our second musubi, I'm going to show you how to cook it in a different way on the stove. You'll notice, um, you know, I don't have a rice cooker, so this is how I usually cook my rice. I already put two cups of that yuki no kakera in here, and I'm going to go through and wash it uh, using a different technique. So um, I'll be right back. You'll notice that this rice uh, pot or this pot is a little bit smaller, so I can't exactly get my hand in to wash it the way I usually would. So what I've done is usually I would make a claw out of my hand and then use that to kind of agitate the grains inside the pot. And you know, the whole purpose is to get the starch off so as long as you're kind of getting those grains to rub up against each other to release some of that starch, I think um, it's enough. So I'm kind of, I can feel the grains like hitting my knuckles and you can already see that that water, that residual water is getting very, very white from all the starch being released. And then you can see um, the water is not totally clear, but um, it's, it's transparent enough. So I'm going to go ahead and um, drain this, and it's going to drain for about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so while that rice is draining, I'm going to show you what we're going to put inside the takikomi gohan. So takikomi gohan kind of means to be cooked in or with the rice. Um, I have carrot, um, which I'm going to cut on a diagonal, thinly. And then I'm going to cut it this way, crosswise, into thin, I want to say matchsticks, but they're very small. And in addition to that, I'm going to put in some aburage. Aburage is a uh, deep fried tofu and it comes in a long rectangle. I cut it in half and we're just going to use half. Um, but it, because it's deep fried, there's some excess oil in it. So I'm going to get rid of that. Usually um, you put it in some boiling water and then you have to drain it, squeeze it. But I have a little shortcut. So I have a paper towel here and I'm going to just wrap the aburage in the paper towel. And then I'm going to take a rolling pin and 
roll over the aburage. Aburage is usually found in Japanese store markets, maybe an Asian market in the refrigerated section or the freezer section. So check both. And you can see already that it has released some of that oil. So we're just getting rid of that excess. Okay. And now we're going to cut the aburage similarly in similar in a similar size as the carrot. So I've cut it into thirds and now I'm going to cut it crosswise like this. Okay, the next item I'm going to make or I'm going to put in is shimeji mushrooms. You can also use dried shiitake if you don't have shimeji, but I'm just going to maybe um, pull apart some of the smaller mushrooms and I'm kind of just eyeball it. This was one package, so I'm not going to use the full package of shimeji mushrooms. And then the last thing I'll add to the rice is this ginger, a few slices of ginger. Okay, so I have um, three different types of shoyu from Kikoman. I know this is a well-known brand, but maybe these are um, different varieties that you haven't seen before. Um, this one here is a double fermented shoyu, and it has a very kind of deep and like a round flavor. I don't know how else to explain it, but it has a very um, kind of rich flavor. It's very good. Um, and this other one is smooth and aromatic. I would say it's not as um, kind of deep as this one, um, but this one is also a very nice um, shoyu. And then this one is gluten-free. Um, I'm gluten intolerant, so I really appreciate that they have a product like this. Um, and instead of the wheat that they put into these, um, rice is used. So uh, for today's purposes, I'm going to use this one, but if you don't have a gluten intolerance, try using one of these um, other ones. You can kind of do a taste test and see which you like better and maybe which would go with which purpose. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and measure out the soy sauce in a uh, Pyrex, in a measuring cup. And we're gonna do two tablespoons of shoyu or soy sauce. And this is gonna be in the cooking water for the rice. Okay, so that's two tablespoons of shoyu. And then I'm gonna do two tablespoons of this takara mirin. It's the same mirin we used in the other musubi. And the reason why I measured it in the measuring cup is I'm going to um, put enough water to hit about one and a half, a little over one and a half cups. So I'm going to go put some water in here. Okay, and the last thing I'll add is a pinch of salt. Um, and that'll give us a nice clean salt flavor. So this is all going to go in the pot with the rice that I've drained. Pour this in. Okay, the other thing I'm going to add is this kombu. It's a dashi kombu. So usually I use this for making uh, dashi for miso soup or udon or anything like that. Um, this is made by Shirakiku and um, you can see it has this kind of white residue on it and that is what we want. It's the umami. And I'm gonna just cut a little piece off for, it's kind of a oddly shaped piece, but I'm gonna cut maybe a piece like that and maybe another piece. Um, and let that sit just right up, right on top of the water. And then I'm going to add the carrot on top of the water on top of the rice. And so once you put this, these ingredients in, we're not gonna mix the rice because we want the rice to cook evenly. 
Then I'm going to put the abura again. And finally, oh, maybe the ginger next. And then finally, the shimeji on top. Okay, this is going to be really nice. So now I'm going to put this on medium heat and when it starts to boil, I will cover it, bring it down, the heat down to low, and then hit the timer for 20 minutes. Once the timer rings, I turn the heat off and I let it sit there and steam for another 10 minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this on the, over the heat. So this is starting to boil right here. Um, so I'm gonna cover it. All right, so now that this rice is done, the instant pot rice is done, I'm going to lift this up. So here's the cooked rice. You can see it's nice and pink. And I'm gonna add some goma, some ses roasted sesame seeds here. So once the rice has been cooked, you don't want to kind of agitate the rice too much because it'll start to break the grain. So you want to be very gentle at this point. Um, I'm going to add a little more sesame seed. This is about two tablespoons um, of sesame seeds. Okay, and to make musubi, um, you're going to need a small bowl of water for your hands, a little dish of salt, and I have a plate here ready for us to put the finished musubi. So I'm gonna dip my hands into this water and make sure my hands are completely wet. This is gonna prevent the rice from sticking to your hands. With two fingers, I'm gonna dip into the salt bowl and I'm gonna rub the salt on my palms. So that'll help coat the musubi in a little bit of salt. I'm gonna take maybe like a handful of rice. It's still hot, so be very careful. And I'm kind of toss it around and then indent a little hole in the center. I have here some umeboshi that I've pitted and cut up into quarters. I had a really big uh, umeboshi plum, so a whole one was gonna be too much. So I'm gonna take a little bit of uh, umeboshi and put it in there and then cover it with some rice and then begin to shape it. So to shape it, um, I'm gonna use my uh, less dominant hand. So in my case, it's the left hand as the base and then my dominant hand, my right hand is gonna go on the top and the right hand or your dominant hand acts as kind of like the roof of the triangular omusubi. So I'm gonna just gently squeeze and then I'm gonna rotate the ball, squeeze again. And while I'm squeezing down with my dominant hand, I'm kind of squeezing it uh, with my less dominant hand um, on the sides. And you really need to do this only a couple of times until you get um, your rice ball. And like I said, you wanna be firm, but you don't want to crush the rice. You want it to stay nice and intact. So. Um, kind of be firm but also gentle. So I'm going to do this again, wet my hands, double finger into the salt, and then I'm going to do another scoop of rice and kind of toss it around in my hand first and then make an indentation for another piece of umeboshi and then cover that up. And it takes some time getting used to, but once you get the hang of it, it goes pretty fast. So to finish off um, the umeboshi musubi, I'm going to take um, a shiso leaf instead of nori and wrap the shiso that way. Shiso and ume are like a match made in heaven. They're really good together. Okay, so our takikomi gohan is done. I'm going to take out the ginger and the kombu. Okay. So now I'm going to 
fluff the rice. And kind of try to incorporate the carrots, the aburage, and shimeji um, gently. Like I said, you want to be very careful at this point so you don't crush the grains of rice. Okay. Just like before, I have my bowl of water for my hands, the salt, and I have also a larger bowl for my um, shamoji for my rice paddle so that it doesn't get sticky. Okay, so first step, like before, is to wet my hands. Two finger with the salt and a scoop of rice. It's still very hot. And shaping it just like before. It's really hot. <laughs> so be careful not to burn yourself. All right, so now I'm going to wrap the musubi in nori. So I use, uh, this is a, from a full sheet of nori. I cut it in thirds, and then I'm going to cut it in half and use half of this third sheet. So I'm going to wrap this on the musubi, and that's it. So there you go. There's these two different ways of making musubi. Okay, so let's have a taste. I'm going to do the shiso one first. Mm. And the crunchy goma, which has a nice um, toasted flavor and the brightness of the shiso. And I didn't quite get into the umeboshi. Mm. And this umeboshi is really mild. It's not like super sour like some of the ones I've had before. Um, so it has a nice mellow sourness, which is really, really yummy. Um, and kind of like a really refreshing uh, musubi, I think. Maybe like a closer. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to try this other takikomi gohan musubi. This is also really a balanced flavor. I have the sweetness from the carrots. The aburage gives it a richness. And um, the shimeji, of course, has a textural um, quality as well as giving you that mushroom umami flavor. Um, the shoyu and the meeting, like the meeting also adds like a nice mellow uh, sweetness to it. And of course the nori also um, giving more umami to the flavor of the musubi. Thank you all for watching. I hope you try some of these musubi recipes at home. I want to thank Janum and I hope you enjoy the rest of the programming. See you at the next one. I don't know about you, but I am ready <laughs> to eat some musubi now. Um, I wish I had been cooking along to that because um, I'm getting hungry. But again, you can find more of Azusa's work um, and recipes, including more of these musubi recipes at um, uh, her um, Instagram and her blog, Humble Bean Bento or Japanese cookbook for beginners, which is available in our museum store, um, full of really great recipes that I myself have been cooking from um, this year. So thank you so much, Azusa. Um, and you saw the musubi in our first presentations um, carried to today. And um, if you make these, please let us know. Um, you can make your own 2020 picnic and maybe recreate our photos or something like that. So with that, I'd like to invite both um, Valerie Matsumoto and Kristen Hayashi back on screen so we can answer a few of your questions to um, 
conclude this program. Hi, you both. How are you doing? Are you hungry as I am? <laughs> yes. Very <laughs> hungry. Very. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we had a few questions both in the chat and with the Q and A. Um, so I just wanted to ask you these to just, um, you know, kind of get a bit more information while we have you here. Um, first, just a quick one, Kristen, that um, fancy jubako, is it made out of ceramics or is that the more traditional Japanese lacquerware Linda Yamoto was asking? Yes, the, the fancy one that I did show is made out of, it's a ceramic. Um, that I think is glazed. Um, and I just wanted to just shout out my, my colleagues in collections um, who uh, helped not only to select and do research on the artifacts, but also to create those amazing glamour shots um, and videos. Um, so thank you, Jamie Henricks, who's our archivist, and Sean Iwoka, our collections associate. Um, the three of us make the collections department at Janum. And um, if you have a chance, you should check out on Janum's YouTube page, um, our Unbox series, which um, does something similar where it goes behind the scenes in collections and also um, goes, you know, talks about the artifacts and their history and, and shows you them up close. So. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'll, I'll put that link in the chat as well. So folks can check that out, but you can also find it on our YouTube channel. Um, we had a question um, kind of wondering about the patterns in Japanese American food culture from Tomoko. Um, so the, uh, the question says, I'm wondering how much of the patterns you see in Japanese American food culture was unique to this ethnic community. For instance, you mentioned that you can change trace change and adaptation, but were these trends also something other ethnic communities shared? And did you see any exchange of new recipes between the US and Japan during the pre-war period? I don't know if either of you. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be something that we come back to. We have a whole series of programming, so. <laughs> but yeah, I know I mean, there was, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that I'm sure that's definitely a part of, of the immigrant experience here, right? Is like adapting to, adapting food traditions to sort of um, accommodate what types of foodstuffs you could find here. And, and I also wonder, you know, how um, like close proximity to other ethnic communities um, also um, changed food traditions. Um, but in terms of like this experience being for other communities, you know, I'm sort of thinking about um, the International Institute or other types of Americanization, you know, programs that, um, um, you know, I think wanted to Americanize, you know, immigrants and to introduce like American foods and American cooking to these immigrant groups. And I, and I assume that that was sort of um, something that impacted, you know, numerous communities. Um, I agree. I think that there was a lot of um, communication and uh, um, about food uh, um, within communities. Um, and also um, I'm thinking that also you know, we think of Japanese food, our Japanese American food as being sort of monolithic, but in fact, the, the immigrants who came were from many different prefectures. And there are a lot of different traditions. And we know this is, for example, if you ask somebody what their ozoni is like, you know, they say, oh, we always make it with like, chicken stock. And I'm going, no, that's not right. You know, because I grew up with my family came from Fukuoka and Totori, and they use a sort of like a kombu Katsuo sort of base and other people use pork. And so it depends what region you came from. And I think that um, the immigrants when they arrived began to share recipes and that, you know, you, I think you find a lot more cross pollination, you know, even within Japanese American food ways because of this, or that, you know, we see, um, you know, at uh, festivals, there's, you know, there's a array of things, you know, that now have been embraced that come, that do have regional and, uh, you know, ethnic cultural significance like the Okinawan dango perhaps. And, um, and then uh, I know that this is true for um, Filipino American diaspora as well, that um, Don Mabalon wrote a, a wonderful uh, essay about uh, Filipino American identities and how that was kind of created and how uh, people from many different uh, provinces in the Philippines were in fact bringing different cooking traditions and then beginning to share their uh, practices and, and their 
you know, their, their favorite foods with each other. And so that uh, I think we can kind of see this process as well. Um, so, so I think that one thing is that I think that Japanese American or Japanese food is much more diverse than we often think even from the beginning, but also that there's all this element of what can they get access to? What ingredients can they get? What can they, you know, how can they substitute for things that they can't get? And, uh, and then at the same time, they're, they're, they're learning things from their neighbors who might be Mexican American or Italian American or, you know, Chinese American, and that they're also get very interested in these new flavors. Everybody likes novelty. And there's a lot of different things to sample. They all love Chinese food. So I think we can see a lot going on. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about different regional um, recipes. You know, I, thinking about sushi, like I didn't have nigiri or, um, you know, sashimi until I was in college because my family, you know, didn't eat that type of sushi. And it's because we were from, we weren't from Tokyo. We were from um, more of the Yamaguchi Ken area where um, I think it's my understanding that um, the nigiri sushi was a Tokyo style sushi. And it wasn't really until after the great Kanto earthquake, I think in 1923, that that style of sushi sort of spreads throughout um, Japan. And so, you know, Japanese immigrants would have already started coming or had come to the United States by that point. And that's why that style isn't really part of the Japanese American um, diet, I guess, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much to you both. We, we did have some questions, I think, about that. And I'm glad you touched on it, about the difference of um, where foods came from regionally in Japan to um, coming here in the US with immigration. Um, another question that, um, I guess on that one, um, it was, let me pull this up. <laughs> um, so you think that the limited access to Japanese, there was a question from Kathy about how did the limited access to Japanese ingredients play in early Japanese home cooking? Um, and I know you touched on that a bit, but um, yeah, I was curious about that as well, because I know that you mentioned in the recipe books, there was some new um, substitutions and things like that. Can you, can you reframe that again? Sorry, I was looking at all the other questions and I got <laughs> sidetracked. Sorry. I was looking no worries. At the it was about the limited access to Japanese ingredients and mm -hmm. what role that played in early Japanese home cooking. Um, I guess on my end as well, if you found any like really interesting substitutions or different quirks of Japanese American cooking um, in your research? Well, um, the two areas that I've looked at were really, I, I um, researched a, a farming community in the Central Valley and you know they got started at a difficult time and then the depression came along and it was very, you know, they were farming, so they produced a lot of their own vegetables and things. But, you know, uh, I think that they were just getting a few staple items. So, um, you know, before there would have been a big sack of rice for your family and you're going to try to get shoyu, you would probably be making your own skimono. And, um, you know, but they were eating very simply. They were shooting jackrabbits, right, for meat. So, uh, so, so, you know, they in in the hard years of getting the community started you know and or, and getting their farm started they probably were not having they didn't have elaborate diets and um and you know they they probably would have been able to get some ingredients but for the these rural people they would have had to go to a city where there was a japan town to get some of the things that they wanted um and uh but they were also growing their a lot of their own food and surprisingly what natsue fujimoto's um, recipe collection really surprised me with was that she was, you know, in the 1930s, she's writing down all these ingredients that she's using in these dishes that her, and they're not holiday dishes, they're everyday dishes that her family likes, different kinds of okazu or, or ways to cook fish. And she is calling for all of these Japanese herbs and things that I, some of which I'd never heard of. I had to look them up and some I couldn't even find online. And, you know, 
some of them are more well known, but it's not just shiitake and mitsuba and mizuna, but there's other things. And so that suggests that there were there are people who are growing these and that it was available to them if you were in you know, a, a, pop, a Japanese American population center like Southern California, where you could get access to these things if you weren't growing it yourself. So I was really amazed at all the kinds of ingredients she actually had access to for their home cooking. So that's, um, so I think that, yeah, so people who were near urban centers, you know, where there was a, a, a Japantown, uh, a Nihonmachi or a little Osaka could get access. But if you were out in the rural area, then it was a little bit more limited. You'd have to, you know, probably just get certain things and make do for others. Kristen, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just thinking um, in terms of inaccessibility to Japanese foodstuffs and having to adapt recipes. I, I see that Gil is in the chat. And is that Gil Asukawa? I know he's written about um, a community in Colorado who didn't have access to Japanese foodstuffs. And so used like, I think it was chilies, right? To make um, some kind of pickled side dish that was sort of reminiscent of, of home or of Japanese cooking. Oh yeah, it is. So I thought that was a really interesting um, you know, adaptation that was made. You know, there's a question about Hawaii food. Can we address that? That's yeah, absolutely. That's what I really, and, and I've talked for a long time. Maybe Kristen would like to start on that one. I, there's a lot that can be said about that. I don't know too much about that. So <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Valerie. <laughs> I can, okay. Is it this question from David? The Can you comment on the influence of Hawaiian Japanese Americans on Southern California Japanese cuisine? There seemed to be a blending of multiple cultures, including Portuguese, Filipino, and Chinese. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's very interesting because the food of Hawaii really reflects um, the late waves of labor immigration to Hawaii. So we can see that at the beginning, you know, we have their foods like like poi, right? We made of taro and certain kinds of um, ways of cooking, um, uh, or, or eating or poke, right? The big poke craze, right? This, these are vestiges of native Hawaiian food. These are native Hawaiian foods that have been adapted. But, uh, and, but there also were waves of people who were, who were recruited to work on the plantations, the Chinese and then the Japanese and then Filipinos and Co uh, Koreans, Filipinos uh, and, and also the Portuguese. And so we see that a lot of what we see in terms of the food of Hawaii is really the, the foods from the plantations where workers are beginning to share foods and beginning to taste each other's foods. And uh, so that um, it, it's, uh, you know, the idea of the plate lunch, right? Is a great, really a, a reflection of those labor practices and, and, the, and the kind of uh, culture uh, that arose. And so of course, many people you know, uh, found that um, working on the in the continental United States was way more lucrative than staying on the plantations. And so, when they could, they, you know, they certainly tried to migrate to when they while they could before the laws changed to the continental United States. And there are a lot of um, uh, certainly a lot of Japanese uh, who had started in Hawaii. Then it was a stepping stone to get to the the coast. And so I think that they brought with them a lot of these food traditions. And um, certainly I think the uh, Torrance Spam Cook-Off, which, which was an annual practice is certainly a great example. Another uh, food that has been embraced by uh, some Asian Americans and Asians, and that reflects US um, militarization because of course, where you find military bases is where you find canned meat, right? And this is really <clears throat> a reflection of World War II and the bases, right? And, and uh, the kinds of, you also find recipes for Vienna sausage and corned beef, uh, as well as um, spam. And so those are, those also reflect um, these other deeper histories. Yeah, we had um, a cooking presentation with Clement Hanami, one of our <laughs> other staff members, and he um, had them cook with some interesting canned beef things that I <laughs> would maybe not touch myself, but I do love a spam musubi. <laughs> um, I just want to get this a question for uh, Valerie. Um, Kathy Masaoka asked if um, is said, I recall hearing that Isai woman would make the sake, which would be shared at the Mochisuki when several farming families came together. 
And was this typical for women to make the sake or alcoholic beverages? I know that some of your research focuses around women and <laughs> farming. You know, I don't know about the sake because I know that um, I do know that there was some bootleg liquor that was made in by some people in the early days when they you know couldn't get access and they could make their own. But what I do know is um, actually that um, the uh, a lot of the Issei women in the farm country made really really tasty umeshu plum wine. And that is something that people in Japan do also, right? For new, you, 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 every year you put, you know, you prepare your, your ume so that you have, you know, this wonderful sweet plum wine for the next year. And uh, certainly that is something that they um, do. I actually had never tasted it until I started doing research. And I went to um, Cortez and I'd never, and, and I remember going to do research and, and it was a very, very cold fall day and, um, and, I was frozen <laughs> and, and there was all this tule fog and everything. And I, and I get to the J, their JACL hall, which is their community center. And I walk in, I don't know very many people and I'm just frozen. And I sit down and they, they rush me to this little table with all these um, elderly women, Issei women. And they're sitting around laughing and talking and their cheeks are rosy and they have a little battered you know, tin of uh, a teapot, which everybody would recognize and styrofoam cups and they, they're, and they're pouring, they pour me a cup and hand it to me. And I think, oh, it's hot tea. So I take a big swig. It's not tea. <laughs> it's, it's umishu. And I was going, wow. And it, I could feel the heat go all the way to my toes. And suddenly I didn't feel cold anymore. I was really warm. And um, one of the women there, they started laughing, but one of the women had made it. And, uh, you know, was well, well known for her umeshu. So uh, there, that is part of the tradition, at least in the farm country. I love great. that story. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're getting some other comments. Um, Kimiko says that I grew up with stories about my great grandpa and grandma making bootleg shoju on their family farm in Southern Colorado and some bootleg sake made in Poston as well. So definitely, I think that one of the things we want to highlight was this <laughs> resourcefulness and this <laughs> resilience. And I do think that that is part of it. Absolutely. Um, we are coming up on our time. Um, Unfortunately, I think we could talk about food for ages. Um, Kristen, you did mention that uh, Gil and said, yes, the um, green chili, the specifically the Pueblo chili from Colorado was used as a replacement for wakame. A Colorado company makes well, wonderful salsa karami. Um, and I know Janam Store did have it. I'm not sure that we're in, um, it's in stock right now, but um, I did taste it. It was really different and delicious. <laughs> Um, I think we can conclude with this question from Brian, um, where I ask if you have any last comments that ask for Valerie, but I think this can go to either of you. If you have any favorite recipe from the JA community cookbooks, whether from the perspective of flavor, novelty, or historical significance. I think I've talked so much. Let's let Kristen start with a question and then I'll answer. <laughs> <laughs> this is all very anecdotal, but, um, my grandmother contributed to the Wesley um, uh, Methodist cookbook up in San Jose. Uh, she was known in the church to, she was a great baker. Um, and I've tried to replicate some of her recipes that were in that, um, in the cookbook. She was known for this yeast, uh, sweet yeast roll recipe that you could turn into a, a Swedish tea ring or like dinner rolls or cinnamon rolls. So I was trying to, to replicate her recipe, but she didn't put very specific, you know, measurements or, or directions. And so making this recipe numerous times, um, it came out different every single time. And there are these little like tricks or tips that she just didn't include, like that the buttermilk needed to be a certain temperature or, you know, where's the best place, you know, to, um, to let it rise. And uh, so it was really interesting to hear family members sort of chime in on their memories of my grandma, like making these different recipes. But I will say that the recipe that's in the cookbook is not specific enough. <laughs> um, so I, I would love to do more research on um, these community cookbooks because I do think they're a treasure, but I guess that's, that's one recipe that I'm familiar with. <laughs> um, 
that's so funny because about because many people uh, talk about wanting recipes, but they weren't written down or they were written down with no measurements, right? And that's we are a generation that expects measurements, and then <laughs> previous generations didn't use them. So it's very interesting how we um, how we uh, what we expect of knowledge and how it should we expect it to be transmitted. Um, I have a bunch of different recipes that I can think of that I really like from a range of these cookbooks. But first, I just wanted to say. Uh, I've just been glancing at the chat. There's so many great um, stories and, and notes and, and plugs for other cookbooks. So I was going to say that I hope that some of you will think about writing um, you know, blog posts for uh, Discover Nikkei because these are such great, you have great stories. And I would love to hear about the bootleg shochu stories. I hope Kimiko will write something about that. This is, but there's, everybody has these great stories. So uh, it's a little frustrating not to be able to get to all of them. So, so please think about that. It would just be fantastic. Um, and I will be haunting Discover Nikkei, hoping to see some of these appear. So um, uh, great recipes, um, you know, um, I've had a lot of luck with the Japanese American community cookbooks because those are recipes that people like and make and they're, they're, they're not just, you know, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're family tested recipes. So, um, so I've had very good luck with them. And um, I, uh, I have had uh, particular um, fondness for um, the persimmon bread recipes in the Northern California cookbooks because where all the persimmon trees are growing. Um, I also um, really like uh, the coconut custard mochi recipe. That is the one that I think I was at, I, I've been asked for the most when I made it. And it's from one of these uh, cookbooks that I think it's from one of the ones I showed today, but I have to go back and check. And um, certainly the microwave mochi is really a godsend if you have to make something like that in a hurry. And and, you know, it just, it, it's, it is a very convenient thing to do. Um, but there are also um, uh, many, many uh, wonderful uh, recipes and I have actually not gone wrong with any of them so far. So, um, you know, but they are, you know, if you look at the really early ones and you look at the more current ones, you'll notice a difference in things like the amount of sugar that is used. You know, you can tell that there are, you know, more, there's, I think there's a shifting, sense of nutrition and you know that reflects the larger society right and different kinds of trends so uh and you also find a, a lot a wider range of uh, of other ethnic recipes that have been included so that have again been adapted to japanese american tastes so yeah thank you so much for sharing i think that I agree. There's just so many exciting stories, and I, I put the link to Discover Nikkei. But we do, we are always accepting um, entries, and it would be really wonderful to hear your stories. And um, please, please share with us. Um, we want to make sure that all these stories and all these recipes, especially, are preserved. Um, I I want to highlight. There's this note from Kathy, and she said, "My grandmother made a baked manju, and I asked if it came from her from her hometown in Japan, but she pulled out a recipe from a newspaper cutting in the 1970s." So I think that that's really indicative of kind of what we've been talking about today and the ways in which food and these recipes have been adapted over time. Um, and I guess. We can get one last thing. Um, someone's asking for scholarly books or research papers on these topics, or I'm gonna ask for just if there's anything else that you think people should check out about this that has been helpful to you in your research so people can continue this learning. Um, Kristen, did you wanna start off? Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not a food waste scholar. I would love to be, um, but uh, I hope Valerie will write a book. <laughs> <laughs> on Japanese American foodways. I think someone else mentioned that. Um, but yeah, offhand, I don't, I don't have sources. Okay. I can, um, I can mention a couple of things. Um, actually, that um, of all the ethnic studies, Asian American studies is most interested in food waste. So there's beginning to be a lot more. And, um, and certainly there's a lot of um, sort of more journalistic food writing uh, by Asian Americans online. Um, but one uh, anthology that might be kind of fun, and I have an essay in it, uh, is called Eating Asian America. 
and it was uh, co-edited by I'm, Joy's nodding, so she knows this one, right? I just checked it uh, out from the library, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's it's got um, a lot of great things. It includes uh, Don Mabalan's great essay about Filipino food. It, it includes kind of a range, but I think that's a very good place to start because in our in the footnotes, there's a lot of other sources that are mentioned. And um, just for sheer fun, I highly recommend a book called Fortune Cookie Chronicles. Uh, by Jennifer Eight Lee, and Jennifer and Eight is the number Eight Lee, and I think she actually did a signing uh, years ago at Janum, and it's it's uh, the subtitle is Adventures in the World of Chinese Food or something like that, and that is really really a fun read. My students like that a lot, but it takes through through a lot of the history of Chinese food, but also gives you a sense of the things that other Asian groups were facing, the history, the current uh, situation, the current labor, and also just how people think about food, how second and third generations relate to these foods and how that relates to identity. So that's kind of a, a fun, fun book. Uh, there are also a lot of new books about different restaurants and chefs. Um, it's, it's really, there's just a huge uh, outpouring, but um, I think, if you're looking for scholarly work, uh, eating Asian America is a good place to start. Yeah, I actually read your essay in that and so a few of the others in preparation for this. And I was really enjoying just the rich histories that that highlighted. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, I know there's some questions about Oshogatsu and things like that. So I do want to encourage you to tune in to our part two of A Taste of Home, which will be in December. Um, it's actually December 13th, um, the same time. And we'll be talking about celebration foods and hoping to pull in some recipes and hearing from people like Emily Anderson about food scholarships. So I'm really excited for that. Um, again, want to thank the Japanese consulate for their support of this program. Um, and we're really excited to continue this conversation um, and hope that you'll continue to check out the books from both <laughs> Valerie and Azusa, um, as well as uh, you know all of the other um, stories and share your own cookbooks. So um, with that, um, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to leave the Zoom call open for a few minutes so people can kind of look at the chat and pull any links or resources that they would like. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming and thank you too, especially for sharing all of your knowledge and um, passion for the subject as well. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope everyone has a really safe and wonderful afternoon and gets to eat some delicious food. <laughs> here, here. Thanks. Yeah. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I would think everybody's really hungry now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>